Well, going forward without USC and UCLA, the Pac-12 needs to have as many widely viewed football brands as they can. And as usual, we're kind of overlooking Utah. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I am your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights-free and beloved Conference of Champions. Please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review the show wherever you listen to or watch it. We're almost a three thousand subs on youtube which is awesome that's that was my goal before the season started we can get there so if you're watching you haven't subscribed please do so we have jt wister still today he is the host of the locked on utes podcast youtube and wherever you get your podcasts all year long jt this is not a an unfamiliar feeling i think for you what i alluded to there in the intro and by the way i will freely admit i am 100 percent guilty of this of highlighting Oregon and Washington as being the biggest television brands for the Pac-12 going forward. Because I think they are. Oregon's brand, yes. Washington's market, I think those are your top two. But to say that there's a huge gap then in viewership and attention and pedigree when you put Utah in the mix, I don't think is accurate. So as usual, when people say, you know, oh, well, what about realignment? What about this school jumping? You need this, that, and the other thing. Like, Utah is still sitting right there, the two-time defending Pac-12 champs. Brands will always dominate viewership when it comes to college football, but the second best thing is to have a winner, and that is what Utah has been over the past few seasons, not just as conference champions, but in general, they've made out well in big and entertaining games. I mean, you think about the Rose Bowl. Yes, they would go on to lose the Rose Bowl, not the most recent Rose Bowl, but the one two years ago. I mean, what a fun game that was. Epic game. Going back and forth with Ohio State, I thought that was great for Utah's brand. What they did against USC this past season, not just in the Pac-12 championship game, but particularly at home in what was one of the top college football games of the season. Their game against Oregon came down to the wire that they ended up falling in in that one as well. Their game against Oregon two years ago when Oregon came into Rice Eccles and Utah ended up beating them. And all these matchups I'm talking about, you're talking about matchups between two ranked opponents. So they're going to get a high billing on an ESPN or off FS1, wherever they're going to end up at, they're still going to be available to a wide audience because you, you're you channel surfing and you're like, oh, this is two top-ranked teams, so that will be a good game. I'm going to turn into that. And that is what Utah is able to offer with that stability with Kyle Whittingham running it. No matter, look, they've been lucky to have Cam, uh, Cam Rising the last few years, but no matter who the quarterback is going to be of this Utah team, you know what their identity is, how they want to run the ball. They're going to play strong defense. They're going to continue to be a ranked team. I don't see a world where even after all these guys leave that Utah still is in a top 25 team for the next few years going forward because that's what they've continued to be even when they weren't winning Pac-12 championships. And instead, they were just getting to the championship game and then ended up falling in a bummer of a fashion. But yeah, I, I think Utah is here to stay. And I think it helps that they're going to draw in views because they're going to continue to be a highly ranked team. And people are going to continue to want to watch those games because they're going to be amongst the best teams in college football and should be pretty entertaining. Yeah, and you talked about how brands dominate television ratings in college football. That is 100% true. Markets 100% matter. Do not get us wrong. We're not ignoring mm -hmm. it. Both things, you know, factor in there. But you can see brands kind of supersede their market. The most viewed team in the Pac-12 over the last several seasons is Oregon. They're not in the biggest market in the Pac-12. Mm -hmm. They're in like the fourth biggest market. It's the Bay Area and then I think Seattle and then Phoenix. I know that all those three yeah. are above the Portland market, but Oregon has a brand that's gone be out, uh, beyond their state, right? Or you look at you know the most viewed teams in the Mountain West. Boise State is near the top. Why? Because of their brand. So they can get people to watch them who are not their, just their own fans or who are just in that immediate market. And you, know, you talked about brands being uh, so important. Brands also do a lot of winning, right? Those are the teams that everybody's watching. Who do you and I watch that are not in the Pac-12? Alabama, Ohio State, exactly. Michigan, Georgia, because they are winning at a high level. So I, I think that Utah is still kind of in its early stages relative to what their TV potential can be for the Pac-12 going forward, because I think their brand has elevated 
considerably over the last couple of years. Winning the conference in back-to-back seasons gives you, I think, that, that sort of pedigree in the eyes of a lot of college football fans. But I think there's still room to grow on that front to make Utah more more like appointment television for fans that are not just in the Pac-12 where they're saying, oh, hey, Utah is making a run to the playoff or Utah is really good or Utah is playing a good team. And I think this year's schedule helps with that too, playing both Florida and Baylor. That's a great point. There are so many high pro. I mean, this schedule is brutal. As we've talked about in terms of Utah <laughs> chances at a, at a 3 P. not to spoil our third segment, we'll get into later, but they'll still have a chance to, but uh the Florida game is going to be on ESPN. The The Baylor game is, I believe, going to be on ESPN or if not, one of the higher networks as well. I think it's, I think it's ESPN. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get UCLA. It's going to be a top game. And look, I don't love – I'm okay with college football on a Friday night. It, that's still high school for me. But them against Oregon is still going to rake in a lot of views. I think there's a lot of people who will be staying home or rushing home to be able to catch the conclusion of that game against Oregon State. We are talking about the Oregon game. Uh, the the so road games, especially Washington, USC, getting to play Deion Sanders is going to be huge this season for Utah as well. I think you're going to get that Arizona game late in the year could be a lot of fun too. There's a lot of fun teams in the Pac-12. There's a lot of teams that are going to be ranked in the Pac-12. So that is only going to continue to boost Utah. As you mentioned, they've continued to win. And now that they are back-to-back Pac-12 champions, they saw that bump in recruiting. I think they'll see that bump as well and kind of most being one of the more viewed teams as well. I think they'll have a chance to crack the top 30 this coming season overall because of those high profile matchups they're going to play. We were talking a little bit earlier just about how, you know, so many teams in the Big Ten benefit from playing in Ohio State or a Michigan. Right. We're talking about that off air. Um, that's going to apply for Utah in some ways as well and teams playing Utah. All the Pac-12 teams are going to benefit from the conference being really good this year. When you and I did the win-loss totals not that long ago, all these Pac-12 teams were over eight wins basically and they had the most teams over eight wins in a single conference last season and they're in a great chance to do that again so i definitely think utah is in a very strong position to continue to build their brand nationally because they've continued to win and they're going to continue to play big games and that's important to this stuff yeah those florida and baylor games will both be on espn in, in the first couple of weeks and by the way it's not as if Utah hasn't, you know, benefited from playing the UCLA's or the USC's uh, mm-hmm. of the world as well, what? who are consistently among the most viewed teams in the Pac-12, largely because of their market size. And you just have so many people in Los Angeles, like they've benefited from that pull-up effect as well that you were talking about. That'll that'll lay out in just a sec. But now, you know, without USC and UCLA there, they do kind of have to start, you know, it's in the Pac-12's best interest to have them be a more appealing team to watch for teams that are outside the Pac-12 to draw a big audience because you only have, you know, a couple games where you'd say the viewership would get, you know, pulled up, quote unquote, by the the opponent that you're playing. That's probably Oregon and uh, Washington to an extent. So over the last couple of seasons, there there are numbers that are really nice and uh, orderly fashion laid out on uh, medium.com by uh, by Zach Miller. He's done this each of the last uh, a couple of, of years and cites his sources accordingly. So Utah, each of the last couple of years has failed to crack the the top 30 in in viewership in all of college football. They have in, in average viewers per game over the course of the regular season. So the, the encouraging thing though is in 2021, they were... <laughs> Interesting, interestingly enough, uh, basically tied with Washington. They were they averaged 994,000 viewers per game that year. Washington averaged 985. That is in TV numbers and ad revenue and whatnot. That is a negligible difference. Then in 2022, JT, after winning the Pac-12 championship, they went from being 33rd in the country, or sorry, up from, they went from 37th up to 33rd they then averaged over a million viewers a game and i think when you have a profile that is that is elevating the way that utah's is you're not just going to get more interest from utah fans but you'll also be able to get the sorts of games like florida and florida and baylor weren't scheduling utah 10 years ago right that was not happening but when you win when you get when you when you get on teams radars more and more that's not going to do anything but help your program and help the conference overall and for all of you out there you can help yourself by going to check out FanDuel because that's your, where you can take your first swing if you haven't already at betting major league baseball get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200 just bet 20 bucks you'll land $200 in bonus bets win or lose. 
That's 200 bucks that you can spend on everything from the money line to over under to who's going to hit the first home run all in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get up to $200 in bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Got our second segment sip, and now I'll turn it over to my man, uh, JT, on the thought that I was uh, laying out there before we smoothly, might I, transitioned into into the ad read from from our sponsors at FanDuel. The the winning tends to lend itself to more viewership, bigger brand awareness, better recruiting, and all that sort of stuff. How do you see Utah continuing to be able to grow themselves in that sense, which is something the Pac-12, frankly, would really like to have happen because. Not just a tandem of Oregon and Washington having that being a big game, but you want Oregon, Washington, Utah to every time they play each other, you want that to be must-see television for Pac-12 fans and beyond. What Utah's done a really good job of in the past is they've found the under-the-radar recruits. The Devin Lloyds, the Brant Keithies were, I believe, two stars when they came into this program. And Devin Lloyd, obviously now first-round draft pick. Brant Keithy, one of the most prolific tight ends to ever come through. Utah still has one more year left here. Utah's done a really good job of finding those guys. They've recruited exceptionally well. They found the under the radar guys. Well, now that they've won back to back Pac-12 championships, it's allowed them to get in on some of the top talented guys in college football overall. They just welcomed in their first ever top 25 recruiting class and their recruiting class drastically changed after their Pac-12 championship game. It's not a huge skyrocket and they really recruited the state well. They brought in some of the top players in Utah, which I think was a huge get for them, keeping them in the state, not letting them leave. It's one of the reasons we see teams like Georgia so good right now, right? They get a lot of the big offensive and defensive linemen they get them to stay at their schools overall versus you get some teams like an Ohio State does a very good job prying some of the top quarterbacks from other states because they don't they rarely come from Ohio in general right but one thing Utah is doing a very good job of is they're finding those hidden gems in other states and now they're bringing in the top recruits overall and as we mentioned they've already done a really good job seeding through some of those lower seeded recruits to figure out okay which guys do we think has the potential to be a really key contributor for our team now the talent pool has been opened even more and they have an opportunity to bring in these even more talented players and I trust this staff to recruit guys that are good fits. And they've, Utah has done a really good job recruiting in the past, as I mentioned, too, not just the under the radar guys, but the guys they found. The, the three stars have, have really hit as well for this Utah football program. So I, I think Utah football is here to stay because they offer you three really important things if you're a college football player. They offer you a chance to win. They give you a chance to play right away. That was something that was huge for Clark Phillips coming to Utah, right? When he originally, the Ohio State defensive coordinator, I believe he left to become the Boston College head coach or the defensive backs coach, whatever it was. That led to Clark being like, you know what, I'm going to go to Utah. But I think the other thing that really appealed to him about Utah was he's a four-star talent at Ohio State. He's not playing right away. At Utah, comes in, he's a three-year starter. Utah gives you that opportunity to come in, start right away. You know you can win. And based on the recent guys, mentioned Devin Lloyd, also can throw out there Dalton Kincaid, right? You can come in and get developed, a place that is going to hone in your skill set to make you into a first-round pick for the NFL draft. So I think that's something that's really exciting. The 24 class is already off to a good start for Utah. They landed Zach Wilson's younger brother, Isaac Wilson, who's the top quarterback in Utah and a top 15 quarterback recruit, according to 24 seven sports too. So this Utah team has done a good job. They also have good recruiting footprints in Texas, California, and Florida, the three best high school football states. So I do feel like this Utah football program is here to stay. And look, we could talk about, Kyle Whittingham potentially leaving, but who they would promote in that instance would be a guy like a Morgan Scally, who I do think would do a good job with continuing to run the ship. And I think it would be something similar to the transition we saw of when Urban Meyer left Ohio State. Ryan Day stepped in and they've stayed exactly where they were. I'm not saying Utah is going to go to Morgan Scally and then they'll be up by Ohio State. I'm saying they will stay where they're at and be right on the cusp of the college football playoff. And as we know, had it been extended, expanded for the last two years, Utah would have been in the CFP as well. So I, I think this Utah football program is in a really Really strong position and they've even just launched their own nil the crimson collective fund to try to bolster and compete with some of the top other nil teams overall so i think they're doing taking all the right and necessary steps on and off the field to continue to be relevant in the pac-12 and in college football in general yeah the only thing that i can really see is slowing down utah right now because they've been so steady because the recruiting is starting to you know step it up a, another level a, as you mentioned and i think that has to continue continue to elevate yes. for them because Oregon's going to recruit at a high level. Washington, when they do it right, can recruit at a high level. Don't sleep on Stanford High School recruiting, by the way, currently top 15 in the country in the 2024 cycle. They've landed the next great modern day high school quarterback prospect in Elijah Brown. Uh -huh. Those Stanford Cardinal 
have mm-hmm. have done that. I, that could be a slower build, but on the recruiting front, Stanford has had some great classes there, so don't sleep on that. But Kyle Whittingham departing would be, I think, certainly a concern to raise, uh-huh. even if Scally's capable of doing a good job. Ryan Day having that sort of handoff, oftentimes it works. Other times, not so much. Sometimes you have short-term success with it, like Mark Helfrich at Oregon, for instance, had some short-term success, didn't work out in the long term, right? Sometimes you think that candidate is in-house. Washington thought they had it with Jimmy Lake. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. So that would be the only thing that I could see as being a major derailment to potentially a derailment to the program is Kyle Whittingham decided, yeah, okay, I'm, you know, 60 some odd years old. I'm, I'm done coaching. I'm going to retire. And, you know, we, I think we talked last year about his contract, having that clause of him retiring and then going into like an advisory role, essentially within the athletics department, like he'll stay around, but he won't be the head coach of, of the program. But other than, other than that, like, let's say Kyle Whittingham stays, I think Utah, as they are currently operating, can continue to be a conference contender year in and year out. Because you look at mm-hmm. not just the last two seasons in which they've won, but each of the last four full seasons of college football, JT, it's been Utah in the Pac-12 championship game. They lost to Washington in 2018, Oregon in 2019, beat Oregon in 21, beat USC in 22. So they are they have become a mainstay in the college or in the Pac-12 championship game but how do they keep doing that in the long term assuming Kyle Weddingham stays there is it just rinse and repeat or do you think there are any areas where uh, they might need to elevate this that and the other thing like you said I think continuing the recruiting trend to rise would would be a good thing I think as long as look they said they're top 25 this year I think as long as they can continue to stay in the top 30 that would be encouraging but they've been farther back than that before and have won Pac-12 championships and have continued to stay relevant to your point so I really think if they keep up with a similar philosophy in terms of the types of players they recruit, the type of style of football they play as well, they should be able to look, stay relevant overall. I, I think it'll be interesting to see the one thing we hear every Utah um, off season is, are they going to get more explosive? Because that's kind of the one thing, right? Where all these other teams are explosive, high scoring points. Utah zagged a little bit while everyone else is uh, zigging basically. And I, I think for this Utah football team, I think that it would help to get a little more explosive on the outside. But at the end of the day, I think it's not a bad thing to be one of the teams that has one of the stronger defensive reputations in the PAC 12, because you are able to bring in a lot of those. If you're a defensive player in the West coast and you want to, you want to stay in the west coast and play football you want to go play for a defense that's really good and that's that's going to be utah as well so i don't think utah wants to lose their identity but they got to continue to kind of build and grow some of their their weaknesses because you know utah's never going to be a perfect team no team ever is but by kind of trying to get to that mark is how you make those improvements as well so i think that would be the big thing to me they, utah doesn't lose a lot of coaches they've done a really good job of that they did lose their receiver coach who went back to his own modern at mississippi state but you bring in a guy who's a former receiver coach at wisconsin i just think once again like that's a really good addition to this team for that has only lost one or two coaches each cycle. They have avoided what happened with a with a, like a Dabo Sweeney, and I know he avoided it for a long time, but lost both his offensive and defensive coordinators right. uh, one year. Utah was able to keep Andy Ludwig, right? Notre Dame, all those rumors, everything was going on there. Utah was able to bring Andy Ludwig back. That was that's huge. You, you talked about on my show uh, yesterday how how important that is when you're going to get a coach and quarterback who have been together for so long, continuing with that continuity overall. I think Utah has done a really good job of embracing the transfer portal. We've seen a lot of older coaches in college football not not be able to do that and they've kind of fallen out of favor or just aren't in the sport anymore Kyle Whittingham has done a great job of adjusting his style to meet the modern athletes and been more than willing to accept transfers he's had players who have entered the portal like from his team and then welcomed them back in with open arms and Utah's reaped the benefits because of it in a lot of instances I think last year to a Jalen Dixon who made some timely catches for this Utah football team overall so I, I think they've done a good job I think it's just about continuing it look they're gonna be replacing a lot when Cam Rising leaves Brant Keith he's gonna be gone after this Devon Bailey will be gone um, they're gonna lose some of their top running backs too there's gonna be a lot to replace so if, if I had to predict, I think 2024 would be a little bit of a down year for them compared to the expectations of this year, just because you have all those guys, those returners and everything. But I still think this is a team that's going to continue to be relevant. I still think they'll be in the top 25 because they have the coaching, they play the right way, and they're making the strides to improve in some of the areas in the past that have been weaknesses. So I, I do feel like there's a clear path here for Utah to continue to stay relevant in college football, especially if they continue to recruit at the level they just did in this recent 2023 cycle. Yeah, that point you made about Andy Ludwig not going to Notre Dame, I think is indicative of the sort of rise that Utah has already undergone 
And there is another level. There, there are other levels to Utah's brand. Making the playoff would be a, a, a big mm-hmm. next step. Getting to a national championship game, winning Rose Bowl would probably again. Uh, that's yeah. That's that. That's it's another step. But but that alone, Notre Dame going after your OC, very openly courting him and wanting him to be their guy, and him saying no, I'm going to stay with Utah. And st- that's Notre Dame. Uh-huh. And that's a testament to where Utah is at right now and why, as we talked about in the first segment of today's show, they're so important for the Pac-12 going forward because they have the capability to be that sort of program that wins at a high level, competes at a high level, draws viewership, can play in big-time games, can be a top-10 team. And I think they're already in the midst of that rise. They're not there yet. They haven't reached the summit. But I think they're in the midst of it. And Ludwig staying and bypassing Notre Dame, mm-hmm. I, I think is is pretty telling on, on that front. I want to get to our last topic of, of the day because it is an intriguing one to say the least. We talked a year ago about whether or not Utah was underrated in spring football and were they being undervalued and are, you know as potential Pac-12 champs and were they flying under the radar and whatnot. That's kind of Utah's MO. It very much is. They don't recruit at the highest level in the Pac-12. They're not flashy. They're not explosive. They're just good. They're just good. They're the Spurs. They're good <laughs> and kind of boring. Very but they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> but they're kind of boring to the average, not to me, but to the average <laughs> college right. football fan. So... When you look at the prospect of a three-peat, we have seen teams repeat as, I'm pretty sure there's, there have been repeat Pac-12 champions uh, before. I, 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 I'd have to double check that. Oregon technically did it in 2019 and 20, but like, uh, does that really count? Uh, yeah, like I'm an Oregon fan and that's how I feel about it. Like, uh, yeah, okay. So they've repeated as champs. The prospect of a three-peat seems pretty unlikely. Daunting. Is it impossible, though? Absolutely not. I think when you look at all the players you have coming back to this, yes, like you said, it's never happened. So that's where it's like it's going to be really hard for them to do it. But it got a lot easier when Cam Rising announced he's coming back, right? When Brant Keithy's going to be healthy. When, yeah, like coming into last season, we're like, man, how are we going to replace Tavion Thomas after this year? And then, oh, wait, we got a quarterback who turned into a running back, Jaquinton Jackson, who looks even better. You got Makai Bernard back, so you got it there. You have three offensive linemen coming back, too. Your leading receiver and second best receiver are coming back. And is this a top receiving core in the Pac 12? No, but guys who are very capable of getting open, and you have the best pass catching tight end in the Pac 12 who's going to be back and healthy, the guy who lit up Florida last year for 100 yards and looked like he was going to have an incredible season before he got hurt. And then defensively, I think that was the one mistake mistake last year I made in looking at Utah was I, I kind of looked at a Devin Lloyd and I was like, yeah, you know what? I like some of the pieces they'll bring in being able to replace him. Utah wasn't able to do that. But when you look at what Utah last last lost last year, like Mahmoud Diabate, that's that's the kind of guy where it's like you get Leavani Dumuni coming in from Stanford. They're going to be able to do that. And losing Clark Phillips hurts, but you're replacing him with other starters who have been on this team for the past few seasons. And you don't need – look, no one's going to be one of the best corners in the country on this Utah football team, I think. But when you talk about a Clark Phillips uh, – uh, or excuse me, Zamaya Vaughn, who, well, you lo- lost Clark Phillips. I'm getting tripped up a little bit, but Zamaya Vaughn and everyone else, JT Broughton, you bring in Ole Miss. You got capable of corners on the outside. You get Cole Bishop back. There's over eight starters returning on both sides of the ball for Utah. This is a team that returns all the guys who have won the last couple of seasons. So they can absolutely do it again in 2023. The schedule makes it very difficult. But when you just look at the talent, that's where it's like they absolutely could go into any game and you can find a way where they will win that game. The challenge will be winning game after game against some of the country's top teams. But Utah is definitely capable of repeating. And if I'm being honest in August, I will probably predict them to do so, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a great little piece of trivia here for you. Okay. So I don't really count the 2020 season. So let's not, like said, let, yeah. let's say Oregon is we, we don't in Utah either. So. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so. Oregon has never repeated as Pac-12 football champion. They haven't. There is a school that has. Can you name it, and can you name the years? I'm going to guess Washington in 17 and 16. That is an excellent guess. It is incorrect. Yes. So Washington won in 2016 and 2018. Ah, mm Mm-hmm. The only team to ever repeat as Pac-12 champions... The Stanford Cardinal. 
Wow. 2012 and 2013. Hmm. Also, again, I, I understand everyone likes to bag on Stanford, but I would love for them to be one of these brands that's in the mix. Because you're talking TV viewership, market size, and brand. Stanford's got that, right? They're in the Bay Area. They're known for their academics and such, but Stanford football at its peak was really, really good. And I wonder if Troy Taylor can get them back there. But I think we all pretty quickly forget. Now in the portal era, you know, this stuff can be can be different for sure. But Stanford won three Pac-12 titles in the first five iterations of the conference as we know it, which is, of course, entering its final year as, as a league with USC and UCLA there. But the first five champions, Oregon, Stanford, Stanford, Oregon, Stanford. And Stanford remains to this day, along with Utah, the only schools to repeat as Pac-12 champions, which is not a bad feat, uh, to say the least here. But last thing I wanted to, to talk about with you, JT, is the biggest hurdle perhaps to Utah repeating is that the rest of the Pac-12 is good. The second biggest hurdle is that Utah does not have what you would call a favorable schedule. Now, their non-conference games don't factor into the conference championship discussion. They could go one and two as they did in 2021, still win the Pac-12, right? But you're going to have to go at least seven and two in in conference play. That's been the benchmark for the last several seasons. You got to go seven and two or eight and one in league play to make the title game. And that's just not going to be an easy thing for Utah. It, it, it just isn't. They have to play Oregon and Oregon State. They miss Cal, I believe. So you don't they do play Cal. They play Cal at home. They, miss, they play Stanford. Cal? They miss Stanford. They miss Stanford. Oh, they miss Stanford. Okay. So they miss one of the Bay Area schools, which in the old Pac-12 North-South, you know, uh, dynamics there, not one of the pair of schools that you would like to miss. You'd like yeah. to miss one of the Oregon schools probably or one of the Washington schools, but they mm-hmm. don't have that break. They have to go at USC, who's going to be out for revenge. Yep. They have to go <laughs> at Oregon State where they lost in 2021 and is a very difficult place. Only one team's won at Research Stadium in the last two seasons. And they have to play Washington and they have to play Oregon and they have to play UCLA. This is this is just a big, big ask for for Utah. Not that they're incapable of it, but boy, I'd put it at less than 50% chance that they get to the Pac-12 championship game just because of how their schedule breaks. Yeah, it's going to be really tough. To me, the key comes, you have to go two and two in your games against USC, Oregon State, Oregon, and then uh, Washington. Washington, thank you. You have to go two and two in that, which means you have to win at one of those places on the road. Now, Utah was able to win in 2021 on the road at USC, but they, they look a little bit different this time. That around. was a four and eight football team. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and to your point as well, just... They're going to be out for revenge. And I know this isn't popular amongst Utah fans to like Caleb Williams. I, I think Caleb Williams is worth all of the draft type he's getting before the season Me starts. Me too. But it's going to be really hard for Utah to win this game. I think they definitely can, but it's going to be really tough to do it in that regard. It's also going to be really tough to win in Washington. And you just mentioned how hard it is to play at Oregon State. Look, this Utah team hasn't lost a true home game since 2018. It's one of the longest active streaks in college football um, in general, even if you ex- include the COVID season. Their home winning streak is up to 14 now at this point because they have won the last two seasons at home overall. But it's going to be a very challenging task because, as you mentioned, then Utah has to do a good job, as they've been able to do. But we saw last year, like a UCLA fall to Arizona, right? You play Arizona. You play Colorado late in the season when Colorado could be playing their best football. You, you also play a team like UCLA, as you mentioned. I, I don't think that's the team that upsets uh, Utah earlier in the season or just is their first home loss of the year, assuming they beat Florida. But it's still a really not a cakewalk. Game. It's not a cakewalk. And you, you, last year, Utah got lucky in terms of how their schedule played out, where they had a little bit of a break when they took on Washington State. Then they took on Stanford and Arizona as well in some order like that. Look, and those teams, especially Arizona, was better, right? But you got Arizona at home this year. You have to go down to Tucson to play them. There's not really that break in the schedule this year. You, It's kind of one uh, little bit of an easier game versus one tougher game, but no real cake walks outside of, I, I know you love Cal, but Utah should be able to take care of Cal at home and maybe Arizona State at that point in the season, depending on how yeah. you go for Kenny. No, I think, I think Cal at home and, and playing – and you have Arizona State at home too. Yeah, Arizona. That, that 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 shouldn't be a problem. I would not sleep on going to Tucson though. I agree. I would not. I would not sleep on that game. And it just 
there's just so little margin for error. And then you need help with tiebreakers, right? Like they got last year. They got Because last year you had one team at you had you had one team at eight and one, that was USC, and then you had a bunch of teams at seven and two, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. Utah got in because of the, the tiebreakers, so you need breaks there. Like it's not impossible, but boy, the, the path is is pretty darn tricky. JT Wister still host of the Locked On Utes podcast, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks as always, my man. Great joining you as always, Spencer. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. No show tomorrow. Back hopefully on Monday. Maybe not till Tuesday. But until next time, have a wonderful rest of your day.